So the next speaker is David Rossi. That fits very well into the um, into the timeline. I think David will join us remotely. I know he's he's on Zoom. While we do that, I maybe introduce him. Uh, David did uh, a PhD in physics, biophysics at the University of Chicago. Then he was a postdoc of Aaron at the LMP in 1965. And as you heard, uh, he was involved in the uh, in introduction of the reconstruction of two dimensional uh, maps from uh, to the images in the M. And he was um, um, and, and applied that to the T4 FH model that you just saw there, uh, which, by the way, is in the Science Museum in London uh, right now, if you don't have it done. And with Tony Crowder and Linda Amos, he was the person who did the first ever EM single particle reconstruction of the virus. He then moved to Texas in 1969 uh, um, and then to Brandeis University in 79, where he has remained since then, and he's an emeritus professor there now. And David continued to work on image reconstruction and worked on uh, actin and bifabellum, for example. Uh, David has received many awards and he's a member of the US. Uh, David, can you hear us? Yes, can you yeah, hear me? Yeah, we can hear you if you just share your okay. slides. Okay, I will share my screen, God willing. <laughs> Something's happening. Yeah, if you just stop the presentation. Yeah, as soon as I can get this thing out of the way. How's that? Yeah, that's very good. We can hear you and see you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to cover the path which I call the 3D ending to the 2D beginning, of the way that uh, 3D reconstruction came about, the steps that were involved. Um, oh, good. Um, uh, Aaron began the study of viruses, of course, with Rosalind Franklin, but I, I think that was a rod-shaped virus. I think the spherical viruses, it all began with a, a hypothesis of Francis Crick and Jim Watson. I, the uh, reasoning was that the virus shells are made out of identical subunits and they must bond equivalently. And so it's the biggest symmetry group that you can have with that's spherical is icosahedral. So they had hypothesized this, but it would require that, uh, that virus shells have no more than 60 subunits. And of course, what Tony has said uh, is that many shells had more than 60 subunits. And so the solution to why, how you could build a shell with a cathedral symmetry and more than 60 subunits, I think Tony and Aaron have covered, was the idea that you could um, introduce strain into the structure so that you could have fivefold and sixfold um, interactions that were almost but not quite equivalent, hence quasi equivalent. But it also explained how you could assemble helical tubes out of these proteins. This one, uh, there were a number of polymorphic forms, a tube was one of them. And um, here's a helical tube uh, that uh, Tony had mentioned from the capsid protein for the T4 bacteriophage, the head. This is a tube. And of course, in the early days, people had these beautiful negatively stained structures. And sometimes you think you could see a subunit of where the arrow points or maybe a ring. But then other places you really couldn't. And the question was, was the sample not well preserved? Now, about this time, 
Roy Markham, who was a virologist, a plant virologist, um, introduced photographic superposition. What Roy did is he put his negative in an enlarger, he made a short exposure on a piece of uh, photographic paper, and then he would advance the paper by a little bit in some direction, by some amount, take another exposure, and he would continue that shifting and re-exposing to generate a sort of average. And Markham subjectively chose which directions and amounts to shift by whether he liked the resulting image. But Aaron had a better idea. So Aaron and Jack Berger inter, uh, introduced optical diffractions. They took the negative and put it in a diffractometer and got the diffraction pattern. And that pattern would test all possible amounts and directions of shift and would objectively rate the choices. Now here is an optical diffraction pattern that Tony had shown and wanted to show you that it consists of two sets of spots related by a mirror line. That mirror line arises because you have a near side and a far side that are flipped around the helix axis. And I've drawn two unit cells in here, one black and one red. And the key thing as Tony mentioned is that these near and far side spots are separated in space. So even though in the image, the two sides overlap in diffraction space, the two sides do not. And the point is that these, these reflections are so sharp and clear that it means that the problem is not disorder, the problem is two-sided. And the positions of these reflections tell you, would tell you how to shift and how much to shift by and in which direction to get an average image of one side a la Roy Markham. But Aaron had a better idea. So when I arrived, he had been trying to get a filtered image. Um, along the lines uh, that uh, Tony had mentioned. So in fact, um, we added to the optical diffractometer, which was kept in a dumb waiter. Um, and the modifications, in the modifications, what we did is we added a camera, the back, here's the imaging lens and the photographic film plane. And this camera was focused on the subject, as simple as that, with the diffraction plane just ahead of this imaging lens. And these modifications were built by Dave Hart with parts applied by Michael Fuller. And at the 50th anniversary of the LMB, I went to visit Aaron along with a, a couple of colleagues. And Aaron mentioned that one of the real secret weapons. The, one of the secrets of how well we did was Michael Fuller. Because Michael Fuller, you would go to say him and ask, you know, I need this. He would say, sure, he would get it. So I think he, along with Dave Hart, and I will mention other people, were important in, in getting this done. And I had written a little bit saying why I thought this had, these advances took place and not only because of Aaron, but because of the support that was available. Anyway, here's a, a mask in blue here with holes that allowed through the reflections from just one side. And then we would get one of these beautiful averaged image. And of course, in it, you can see individual protein subunits arranged in the helical rings. This is very exciting. I mean, we could see single molecules. Um, almost as exciting as seeing you know, single atoms that you can do today. Um, uh, but Aaron, uh, as Aaron has mentioned, we then turned this to the T4 tail. Um, John Finch had some beautiful pictures. And so we made a filtered mask, only this time, instead of having sharp, discrete spots, we had layer lines. So we made a mask allowing the layer lines through. And as 
Tony and, and Aaron have pointed out, you can see here, this, this feature is an outer feature. And then inside is this other, what Aaron calls a helix, that is an, an inner feature. And so even though we have separated near from far sides, we haven't separated the features from one radius to the next on one side. Um, so you don't really, in 2D, get a good picture of the subunit. But Aaron had an idea. Now, based on work with Ken Holmes on TMV, Aaron said, I remember this, we could generate a three-dimensional map of the T4 tail. The key is we would use a Fourier Bessel transformation, which is how Ken and Aaron were, uh, were um, conducting their structural studies of TMV. And from just one image, that one image I showed you, we could generate a three-dimensional map from the amplitudes and phases from just this one image. In fact, we'd get two, one from the near side, one from the far side. So um, we set out to measure the amplitudes and phases. And at Aaron's suggested, suggestion, we tried holography to measure our first set of phases. It worked, but it was too difficult. Not only was it too difficult, but since I was doing it, I thought I would lose my mind. So I thought maybe we should try computing a Fourier transform because then you compute the phases. As, as Aaron had mentioned. I hadn't realized that Max uh, couldn't understand how we got the phases, but that, that's a separate part. Um, the, the point is we had a lot of tools to do it. And I had gone to the crystallographers to ask them about computing for a transforms. And they told me that was too hard, uh, they're too big, computers are too slow, but they didn't try to do it by holography. So I didn't pay attention to them. And um, we began to put together a Fourier, a Fourier transform program. And we had a lot of tools to do this work. Um, thanks to Uli Arndt and Tony and Frank Mell and Tim Gossing, we had a digital densitometer so we could actually digitize our glass plate images. And uh, we had programming help from Tony Crowther and Peter Moore. And the other thing I wanna mention is that the computer was in London, an IBM 7090. And this list of people we have here, Angela Mott, Diana Singleton, and so on, these computer ladies would take our punch cards and mag tapes and everyone else's into London twice a day to do computing, once in the morning and once in the afternoon. And above all, of course, we had the beautiful micrographs from John Finch. Well, um, after some work, um, this is our optical transformed on the uh, optical uh, bench. And this is our computer transform of that same micrograph. And this is a, an output, a line print. Everything was done a line printer. We printed numbers zero to nine to represent the amplitudes. And then we contoured them by hand. And here is a, a line that we took through. And here is the data from that line through the Fourier transform the amplitudes on top and the phases on the bottom. And what you can see is the phases are symmetric as they are supposed to be for an even numbered layer line. So we collected this for all the layer lines. And then we used Ken Holmes helical free program to calculate three dimensional maps for six T4 phage tails um, and we averaged them by eye, meaning we drew a, a sort of uh, the, out, the outer outline of the structure and we stacked up the transparent sheets over a light box. And then we sort of drew what looked to be a, a by eye average. And that is in fact what is shown here. And here you can see 
we had interior features where there was negative strain, stain, um, as indicated by these wires with outer features. So um, the question was not answered. What about non-helical structures? What do you do? Now, John and Aaron had worked this out for the polyoma virus. And basically what they did is they built a model, be it a physical model or in the computer, as Tony had shown you. Um, and they, they tilted the model and compared them to the micrographs. Um, and I think here's an example um, of their model. So the point about the tilting, as I think Aaron said in it, this was their structure was not taken lightly because at the time there was a raging argument over whether there were 42 or 92 capsomers in the polyoma virus. And Aaron and John had written a paper that said, no, there were 72. So they got it from both sides. Um, and there was a great deal of pushback for their model. Even though their model explained the images, people weren't convinced. So John and Aaron argued, if you tilt the model and the virus about the same axis by the same amount, and you get the same pattern, then the model must be unique and correct. So here is a tilt. Here is the, uh, a tilt, tilt pair is about 17 degrees, which is all you could do. Um, I think it's like plus or minus eight degrees in each direction on the Siemens. So you can see an image here corresponding to this. You see this sort of eye. And here is a sort of threefold view with these three units here. And you can see it matches. And again, here's another example. And I want you to remember this pair in particular, because we remember this threefold and the single eye, because we'll come back to it. So they argued that their pattern must, their, their solution of the structure must be correct. But the question remained, how many tilts do you have to do to prove your model is correct? And how does one to get a model to tilt? About this time, Aaron and John decided they would work on fraction one, which is uh, um, a plant protein, it, it has symmetry. And <clears throat> they were, uh, would have a model, a physical model built out of, I believe, doweling or broomstick handles or something in the shop. And they would use Don Casper's method of covering the model with plaster of Paris to simulate negative stain. And it was supposed to be my training and how to solve a structure. So I was in charge of putting plaster on the model, taking it down to an x-ray set in the basement, not a, a, a medical x-ray set, and making images of the model. I would then bring them back the images. They would see they weren't right. They would have the shop adjust the model. Then I would plaster it and take it down. And this went on for a couple of weeks, maybe a month, and they could get nowhere. So they eventually gave up. They could not, they could get one view to look right, but then if you tilted it, the structure and took another x-ray pattern, it didn't look right. So it was abandoned. Now, what happened was we had thought of images as two-sided, a near side and a far side. And that really covered up what was the real issue. And I could remember that it, Aaron and I went and talked to people about, you know, how do you determine a model? And we really couldn't get an answer. And I think the language that we used, in, in fact, kind of blinded us to thinking of them not as one or two sided, but as projections. Once you know their projections, then the central section projection theorem that Tony has mentioned comes in. And the problem is immediately evident that what you do is collect a bunch of views, determine the three-dimensional uh, Fourier transform, and then you invert the transform. That was the base, basis of it. But um, um, 
the, the solution could be written as a set of linear equations. That is, you had a bunch of observations from, from your images, and you then wanted to operate on them to get the three-dimensional densities. You get a series of linear equations and you want to solve them. And this matrix that relates it to depends only on the geometry. It doesn't depend on the images, just on the geometry. It fixes, that is the views you have, fix how well you can get a solution. That was key. Um, and we had worked, uh, worked out for a 300 angstrom virus, a 20 angstrom resolution, you had about 7,000 unknowns. Now, the 7090 uh, had 32K of memory. It was extremely slow given today's standards and 7,000 unknowns uh, to invert a set of simultaneous equations just wasn't a possibility. So while we had um, an idea of how to do it, to actually carry it out, to do this kind of calculation, and uh, there may have been other solutions. Hugh Huxley had made some suggestions, but you want to do it in a way to get a least square solution so that you know you have an answer. I mean, it, it has to stand up to scrutiny. I think. Aaron was saying how filtering was treated suspiciously. This would be even treated more suspiciously if we didn't have a good solid basis. And the key was a trick, a Fourier Bessel trick. And in this, this is the transform, this is Fourier space, this is a transform of an image. These are rings that, of cylindrical symmetry and each ring represents one set of least squares equations with no more than let's say a dozen or so unknowns. So by using this trick, um, we were able to reduce one enormous set of equations that was intractable on the computers into many small sets. And an important aspect of using the least square solution is that you get as part of it eigenvalues. And these told us if we had enough views to get a good solution. And here is uh, in fact what we did. Um, these each, uh, so the basic idea is that if you have a certain error, average error in your data, that error will be propagated into the answer, the solution, the structure, according to the average value of one over each of these eigenvalues that you calculate from the normal matrices. So um, we took that one pair that I showed you and calculated the um, average inverse eigenvalue for each ring. We have about 80 rings, so we get about 80 measures. And what you can see down here is if you have one view, now remember one view with icosahedral symmetry is 60 views because there's 60 equivalent orientations. So you do have tilted information. Um, and if you just have one view and you impose icosahedral symmetry, what you can see is that you have um, some inverse eigenvalues, this is the log, it's greater than three, which means that the error would be multiplied by over a thousand times in the answer. Well, that was clearly not tolerable. You couldn't solve it from one view. But with two views, now you have these, these the eigenvectors that correspond to this and the solution, the noise, would be just transferred linearly in same magnitude. For this, this set, you would get a tenfold reduction. For this set, a hundredfold reduction. So you were getting some averaging and not propagating errors in the data into the solution. Of course, in three views is even better, but two views was enough. 
And remember that single tilt pair with the I here on the threefold axis? Well, that pair generated this map. Now, the big this answers the question, how many tilts do you need to prove the, the model that John and Aaron had produced? The answer is one tilt, one pair, because here is the three-dimensional reconstruction of that virus. And they had argued that it was a T equals seven. And for those of you who know T numbers, it's one, two, seven L, one, sorry, seven R, one, two, and one to the right. So that one pair, if it had been known, would have been enough to put the matter to rest. Well, it did put the matter to rest. Um, so a single tilt was enough to prove the correctness of the structure. Um, so the better method than guessing a model and computing projections and comparing them to the images was 3D reconstruction. And in its simplest form, it doesn't seem that way now, I must say, but you collect a set of images of the structure covering many directions of view, making sure all directions are well represented. Simple. Then you solve for the three-dimensional distribution of scattering density in real space or Fourier space by simultaneous equations or you could use back projection or whatever. The point I think we made was that um, using this, it is the distribution of directions that sets the final uh, ability to get a good map. It is, yeah, you can fiddle with it and stuff, but basically when you collect, collect a set of projections, you've done the work. And if it's a good set of projections, you get a good map. If it's not, you don't. Um, of course, you could have bad images, but the geometry determines like the geometry of a telescope or a microscope, that's, it fixes it. And that was very much what was on Aaron's mind. Um, so I wanna end by saying that the move from 2D to 3D really came about because Aaron had set out to solve the structure of viruses. And I was uh, sad in watching those clips because in it, I could see Aaron and John and they were important to me as were Ken and others, Tony, Linda, Amos. Um, so it's with some sadness that I end with with a picture of Aaron, which I think is a very good picture. It's, uh, thank you. <laughs>